As human beings, some of us are pretty attached to our arms, legs, and various other extremities, and we like to keep it that way. Today, the main risks of losing one of these come from extreme accidents or medical conditions, like vascular disease, diabetes, or neuropathy. But to those born a few centuries ago, the threat of losing a limb, or sometimes even more, was present more than you might realize. Welcome to another entry in the worst punishments in the history of mankind. Lend us a hand, or a whole arm, as we delve into the long history of dismemberment. Dismemberment is defined as an act of removing an entire, large portion from another person's body, either while they're still alive or already dead. This can occur through either cutting, ripping, wrenching, or any other means of removing body parts your sick little mind can think of. In terms of what counts as dismemberment, really anything goes – arms, hands, fingers, legs, feet, even a person's whole torso. Interestingly, while the removal of someone's head does still fall under the definition of dismemberment, this is more commonly referred to as decapitation. So for the purposes of this video, we'll try to steer clear of losing our heads. Oh, and another important distinction, there's also a widely accepted difference between dismemberment and mutilation. The latter refers to the removal of any smaller section of the aforementioned body parts, but without removing an entire portion from their body. For example, chopping off a hand, that's dismemberment. But if someone's skin is flayed or they're eviscerated, meaning their internal organs are removed, that falls under mutilation. Typically, you'd have to do something pretty severe to be dismembered. We're talking about the worst of the worst. Crimes such as murder, cannibalism, or even regicide, the killing of or attempt upon the life of a monarch. We certainly hope that clerical errors weren't all that common among the torturers and executioners of ancient civilizations. After all, somebody would be having a really bad day if they've been written up for jaywalking and ended up losing a foot by mistake. Dismemberment's been part of the human legal lexicon for a long time, at the very least since the famous Code of Hammurabi a set of laws codified by the ancient Babylonian king in 1772 BC. If you've heard the phrase, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, then you're already familiar with this. Hammurabi's approach to justice was brutal and direct, up to and including dismemberment. He made sure the punishment always fit the crime, so if you dismembered someone and got caught, you got dismembered as punishment. In that regard, King Hammurabi was probably the ultimate tough but fair by technicality. But don't get the wrong idea, dismemberment wasn't a practice solely confined to the East. You really could find it all over the world. Now let's take a trip back to medieval-era Europe. Lasting between roughly the 5th and 15th centuries, the Middle Ages were a big time for innovative and gruesome methods of execution and capital punishment, as you likely already know if you've seen or read any modern media inspired by this time period. Interestingly, despite our current day associations between the Middle Ages and severe capital punishments, the evidence for how frequently those occurred tend to fluctuate greatly, especially across the breadth of Europe. There were a few notable peaks in the number of executions, such as during the late 16th century, however, so they without a doubt still happened. And when they did, they certainly weren't pretty. Between 1485 and 1603, England saw the reign of the Tudors, made infamous for not only their ambition but their brutality. The Tudor age was one of bloody political rivalries and religious persecution. And if you know anything about arguably the most infamous Tudor monarchs, Henry VIII and his daughter Elizabeth I, then you probably know they were a royal house who were big fans of creative solutions to certain problems. In other words, they had a lot of their rivals, heretics, those who were at odds with the religious practices of the time, and famously even some of their own spouses, put to death. Henry VIII in particular had six wives during his lifetime, and of the half who met their untimely ends, two were beheaded under the king's orders. It's even been estimated that as many as 72,000 people in total were executed during his reign alone, and many of them would have likely met their death through painful dismemberment, in the practice known as quartering. Often reserved for the crime of treason, the punishment of hanging, drawing, and quartering was written in the law in the Treason Act of 1351. Specifically, this punishment was reserved for men who had perpetrated treason and was one of the most brutal forms of medieval torture and execution. First and foremost, before the eventual dismemberment and death that the process entrailed – oops, I mean entailed – the convicted traitor to the crown would be drawn. This had nothing to do with having a portrait sketch to remember what he looked like before he ended up a few body parts lighter. Being drawn was to be dragged through the streets, tethered to a horse. As was the case with many other forms of execution at the time, this was often a public affair, and grisly as it would have been, they rarely failed to draw a crowd. Citizens would line the streets watching the doomed man as he was drawn through town, often hurling abuse, sometimes far worse at him, as he was shown being publicly brought to his place of execution. 
and if that wasn't demoralizing and degrading enough, often these condemned men would be stripped of all clothing before a horse dragged them through the streets, adding to the humiliation that preceded their death. Upon reaching the public gallows, the prisoner would be hanged. You might think this would be enough for them to meet their untimely end, but it wasn't. This was only the starter course before the main event. During this time period, the drop beneath the gallows wasn't long enough to cause the condemned man's neck to break. Instead, the rope around his neck would start to choke him as he hung there. This would continue to the point where the prisoner was close to death, but very much still alive. After all, they couldn't be allowed to miss the third and final part of the process. The main course of being hanged, drawn, and quartered came after the choked traitor was cut down from the rope that they were hanged by. The final course of this brutal execution menu came with a whole lot more cutting. Many who were put to death by this method had their bodies butchered, with a considerable amount of dismemberment taking place. While they still clung to life, some of the condemned had their hands and feet cut off, and many were also cut open and disemboweled, also while they were still alive. The blood-soaked finale of hanging, drawing, and quartering was different depending on where in the world it was being carried out, with some parts of medieval Europe adding the burning of entrails or beheading to the menu. In some cases where beheading was involved, even after the executioner had removed the traitor's head, their body would then be split into four parts, hence the quartering. Often, although not exclusively, quartering was achieved through the use of extreme force to pull apart and further dismember the body of an executed man. While sometimes a cleaver would have gotten the gruesome job done, there were multiple instances where in order to complete the separation, executioners would require a little added horsepower. Yes, we mean that literally. Sometimes in the Middle Ages, people were punished by being literally pulled apart into four by multiple horses. The bones and tendons of a human being's arms and legs are capable of supporting a lot of weight, even in the case of someone who lived during the Middle Ages, but likely they wouldn't have had a great diet or a whole lot of exercise. But the strength of the bones and tendons is nothing compared to the pulling power of a horse. Firstly, in order to perform the brutal process of quartering, ropes would be used to bind each of the unfortunate subject's limbs around both legs from foot to knee and a binding of both arms from wrist to elbow. The ropes were then affixed to four bars, with each then being fastened to the harness of one of four horses as if they were going to be pulling a plow or a carriage. To begin with, the horses would be made to give short jerks to pull at the prisoner's limbs. Those who were unlucky enough to still be alive after being drawn and hanged earlier would have been crying in agony as their limbs and arms were dislocated without breaking. Then came the worst part. With a whip, the executioner would urge all four horses off in different directions, straining all four of the condemned person's limbs simultaneously. In the event that their tendons and ligaments managed to stay together and resisted being pulled apart, then an executioner would make several cuts with a hatchet in order to assist the dismemberment. Quartering could go on for several grueling, excruciatingly painful hours, only coming to an end when the condemned had perished, their limbs pulled from their bodies. Afterwards, depending on the sentence and the severity of the crime that had been committed, these dismembered limbs were sometimes displayed at the gates of a town. If a beheading had been a part of the process, then in Tudor England that head could often be seen on a spike on the London Bridge as a warning of the fate that could befall those who committed treason against the crown. Dismemberment by horses wasn't the only form of the punishment that became popular during the Middle Ages either. Instead of actual horses, there existed a torture device known as a wooden horse, or a Spanish donkey, that applied the same principle but without the need to wrangle four live horses, making its deadly debut in Spain during the 17th century, hence its nickname. The wooden horse was utilized for both torture and execution. The device consisted of a vertical wooden board with a sharp wedge in the shape of a letter V. A person sentenced to death via the use of one of these would have had to straddle the apparatus as if they were riding a horse while weights were fastened to their ankles or feet and additional restraints were used to stop them falling off. The weights would then pull the victim downward onto the wedge for as long as it took to permanently injure them or when a wooden horse was used to execute someone, they would stay on the apparatus until it gradually split their body in two. Traveling across the world and further back in time on this journey, littered with discarded limbs, we reach ancient China, where there existed multiple punishments involving dismemberment. Some even saw continued use up until as recently as the 1900s, but we'll come back to that one. First, let's talk pains, specifically five of them. Invented during the Qin Dynasty, the first dynasty of imperial China, the five punishments, also called the five pains, were a series of penalties that were designed to inflict the most physical pain and psychological anguish upon the people that were subjected to them. Not all of the five punishments involved dismemberment. 
For example, Mo, which was the punishment of tattooing an offender, usually on their face or forehead, so they would be permanently marked as an ex-criminal. Getting a tattoo certainly hurts a lot, even with modern-day methods of inking, so you can imagine how painful getting it done in the ancient way must have been by comparison, along with the pain of having everyone who looked at you know the crime you committed for the rest of your life. But the rest of the pains were somehow far worse. You've heard that old saying of cutting off your nose to spite your face, right? It's an adage meaning someone who has put themselves at a disadvantage to either gain something or assert themselves, but in doing so hasn't realized the detriment they've caused themselves. Well, back in the Qin Dynasty, there was something slightly more literal, Yi, another of the five punishments, and this one definitely did involve dismemberment. This was an ancient version of rhinotomy, wherein a person's nose would be cut off and removed from their face. Much like the tattooing of Mo, Yi was intended to leave the victim permanently scarred to forever identify them as a criminal. However, given the amount of blood that many lost as a result of the crude rhinotomy, which was performed without anesthetic, by the way, as well as the general unhygienic nature of the blades used, many died as a result of infections caused by the procedure. The same could also occur as a result of you, the next punishment up the scale. While there were many different variations on the punishment throughout different dynasties, commonly you involved more dismemberment, specifically the removal of the condemned man's foot. Some sources claim that this process also involved the additional removal of the kneecap, and in some eras the choice of foot that was cut off differed depending on the severity of the crime that had been committed, the right foot being removed if someone had enacted very serious crimes, and the left foot if their offense was a lighter one. Gong was particularly nasty in the five punishments, especially for the fellas. If it makes you feel any better though, it was reserved for men who had engaged in adultery or so-called licentious or promiscuous behavior. It's hard to describe in detail and in a way that keeps it PG, so let's just say Gong put the member in dismemberment or more accurately, took it away. Male offenders had their reproductive organs removed, being both castrated and emasculated. And if you don't know the difference, after the first you lose one thing and the latter loses you two things. The five punishments didn't exist solely for men either. Female victims were also subjected to them, such as one ancient Chinese woman whose skeleton was discovered in 1999 with her foot missing as a result of you. Some sources suggest that gong for women didn't involve any dismemberment, but might have led to some severe damage to the womb via a beating with sticks, as well as sequestration or confinement to a room. Then there was the fifth punishment, Da Pai, the death sentence. Much like in aforementioned medieval Europe, some of these deaths were carried out by quartering or by tearing off an offender's head and limbs by attaching them to chariots. Other methods included boiling the offenders alive, strangulation, beheading, or something known as Ling Chi, roughly translated to mean the slow process, slow slicing, or lingering death, Ling Chi is perhaps most famously known as death by a thousand cuts. This form of torture and execution was used in ancient China from around 900 BCE all the way up until it was outlawed in 1905. That sounds like a long time ago, but in all actuality it was a little less than 120 years ago. Reserved for particularly heinous crimes such as high treason, mass murder, or a person killing their mother or father. Ling Chi involved using a knife to methodically remove portions of the offender's body. And this wasn't done quickly either, there's a reason it's sometimes known as lingering death. This would take place over an extended period of time, eventually resulting in a person's death, either from blood loss, shock, or infection. The lucky ones died as a result of the direct knife wound to their heart or having their throat cut early by a merciful executioner. The process of Ling Chi involved having a prisoner tied down to a wooden frame, normally in public. While we don't have accurate details of exactly how these executions were carried out, generally cuts were made to the arms, legs, and chest. In some cases, Ling Chi even included the dismemberment of limbs, followed either by chopping off the offender's head or stabbing them through the heart. Some of this dismemberment could well have occurred while the offender was still alive and was done deliberately to alter the body. According to the principles of ancient China, it was important to show a sense of virtue for your parents and ancestors, and this meant that to cut or otherwise alter the body was considered to be an act of defiance against these principles. This means that criminals who were punished with the death by a thousand cuts not only went against their ancestors' wishes while they were alive, but also in the afterlife, as it was believed that any of the changes to one's body before death would manifest on their soul when they went to the afterlife. From a practice of dismemberment that ceased just over a century ago to one that still continues to this day, among the ranks of one of the world's most brutal organized crime syndicates. 
If you know anything about Japan's notorious Yakuza, then you likely already know that these guys aren't to be trifled with. Think of them as the mafia in Japan, who still regularly engage in all manner of organized criminal activity. Since much of what they involve themselves in is highly dangerous and illegal, the Yakuza have solidified themselves as a perpetual fear among Japanese citizens, given the threat that members of the syndicate pose to their well-being and safety. Considered to be one of the wealthiest and most sophisticated criminal organizations in the world, the Yakuza are also known for having strict codes of conduct that its members have to follow, and if any of them step out of line, then they might have to engage in an unconventional ritual that involves dismembering themselves. Known as Yubitsume, the ritual is intended to allow someone to atone for failure, and not just with a heartfelt apology letter. If a member of the Yakuza commits an offense against one of his higher-ups, then it's often used as either a way to punish him or as an opportunity for this offending member to offer up a sincere, remorseful apology, one that will affect him for the rest of his life. Sure, saying you're sorry can be emotionally taxing for the best of us sometimes, but imagine if every time you screwed up at work, your boss asked you to chop off one of your own fingers in order to apologize. Well, that's exactly what Yubitsume entails. Yubitsume roughly translates to finger shortening. Following any serious wrongdoing that either harms the organization, other members, affects Yakuza's income, or otherwise violates their strict code, the standing member responsible will be made to cut off a portion of his finger. Normally, this is performed on his little finger on the left hand, at least to begin with. Sometimes, if someone owes a serious amount of debt to the Yakuza, this can also be considered a method of repayment. But interestingly, while the practice of self-dismemberment has become almost synonymous with the Yakuza in the modern day, they weren't actually the ones to invent Yubitsume. The origin of this ritual is thought to date back to the Bakuto. They were a group of traveling gamblers in Japan. Back between the 18th and 20th centuries, the Bakuto were predecessors to the modern Yakuza, and at the time, whenever they couldn't pay back a gambling debt, Yubitsume was employed. It was meant as a punishment for offenses that, while serious, didn't warrant an execution or having the offender expelled from any criminal organizations they might have been a part of. And as you can imagine, it was a great motivator to make sure these gamblers paid their dues. After all, if they failed to, then it was bye-bye to part of their finger. However, the threat of intense pain of Yubitsume wasn't the only reason for its application. The idea behind it was, if someone has truncated their little finger, then that person is also going to have a hard time holding a katana, and if they can't wield their sword, they'll have a harder time defending themselves. In a way, Yubitsume isn't just paying off a debt with acute pain and a dismembered finger, it's using your own future safety from harm as a currency to make up for your transgression. As long as Bakuto kept paying their debts, they could safeguard their own skills at self-defense. But the long-term consequences would serve as a reminder to any gambler that had to undergo this dismemberment, as he'd forever have a weaker grip on the affected hand, putting him at a disadvantage if he ever ended up crossing swords with someone. Nowadays, when it's practiced among the Yakuza, they can at least slightly modernize the process of Yubitsume in order to make it less painful. According to the Japanese National Police Agency, some Yakuza members use anesthetics to eliminate the pain of dismembering their own fingers. Others might even go to the hospital immediately after and attempt to have the severed portion of their finger reattached after showing it to their boss. Some often require immediate medical assistance afterwards in order to prevent their severed finger from hemorrhaging or to treat an infection. In 1993, a survey by the Japanese government found that 45% of the modern Yakuza members had severed finger joints, while another 15% had undergone Yubitsume multiple times. Luckily for us, the general practice of dismemberment is no longer practiced in most countries in the modern world, but most doesn't mean that all countries have given up this practice in the modern age. For example, in Saudi Arabia, where Sharia law applies, there have been shockingly recent incidents of people having their limbs removed for stealing, such as the case with the Yemeni thief back in, hold your breath, 2013. Humans, the more we change, the more we stay the same. Now look at the Spanish boot, worst punishments in the history of mankind, or watch this video instead.